Well, if you didn't know there was a st- snowstorm out here this morning, there is as many people in the early service as there are in this service this morning, which is amazing. And it's amazing to me that I talked to uh, two or three people who drove more than 50 miles to church this morning in the midst of all this. So thank you for getting out and uh, braving whatever, however many inches. I heard that there's quite a bit of snow out there. When I got here this morning, it hadn't even started snowing, so... Uh, It all came pretty quick. Y'all are as quiet as the early service was. (laughs) So uh, 44 of uh, people from our church are in Israel, and we got word uh, during the first service that they are there in Israel. So uh, be praying for those, Pastor Weaver, uh, Pastor Gary Walter, Pastor Brian, Pastor Anna, four pastors are on that trip, uh, plus Tammy Blady, our office manager. So we're down in staff for the next couple of weeks. And uh, we're just going to kind of lay low and have a party while they're all gone. No, not really, but uh, (laughs) I'm saying that because Pastor Weaver is probably watching. Hi, Pastor Weaver. (laughs) And all of you that are home watching online, thank you for uh, uh, at least tuning in today. And we uh, can't control the weather and when it comes. It's amazing timing that it comes right at the time when people are commuting to church. But thank you for being here today. Um, This is Valentine's week, if you uh, didn't remember. uh, It's kind of a man-made, made-up holiday so that we can go spend money just to prove that we love the person that we're married to or that we're in love with. So however you choose to do that, but guys, I got a poem for you, uh, just especially for Valentine's. This is a redneck poem, redneck Valentine poem. Any of you heard it or, all right, nobody, this is good. A fresh audience. You want to hear it? All right. This is in my best Pastor Weaver, Texas accent voice. Collards is green. My dog's name is Blue. And I'm so lucky to have a sweet thing like you. This is to you, Jeannie, by the way. (laughs) Your hair is like corn silk, a flapping in the breeze. Softer than blues and without all them fleas. You move like a bass, which excite me in May. You ain't got no scales, but I love you anyway. You have some of your teeth, for which I am proud. I hold my head high and odd or when we're in a crowd. On special occasions when you shave under your arms. Well, I'm in hog heaven, awed by your charms. Still them fellers at work. This is so small I can't read it. Still them fellers at work, they all want to know what I did to deserve such a pretty young doe. Like a good roll of duct tape, you're there for your man to patch up life's troubles and fix what you can. You're as cute as a June bug a buzzing overhead. You ain't mean like those far ants I found in my bed. Far ants, that's Texas talk. Cut from the best cloth like a plaid flannel shirt. You spark up my life more than a fresh load of dirt. (laughs) When you hold me real tight like a padded gun rack, my life is complete, ain't nothing I lack. Your complexion, it's perfection, like the best vinyl siding. Despite all the years, your age, it keeps hiding. (laughs) Me and yous, me, me and yous like a moon pie with an RC cold drink. We go together like skunk goes with stank. (laughs) Some men, they buy chocolate for Valentine's Day. They get it at Walmart. It's romantical that way. Some men get roses on that very special day from the cooler at Hy-Vee. It's impressive, I say. Some men buy fine diamonds from a flea market booth. Diamonds are forever, they explain, suave and couth. But for this man, honey, these just won't do. Because you're too special, you sweet thing, you. I got you a gift without taste or odor. More useful than diamonds. It's a new trolling motor. (laughs) Love your Valentine. All right, enough of that. (laughs) It's online, guys, if you want to use it on your special, special day. Shave under your armpits part, that's pretty special. 
Well, we uh, started a new, starting a new series today over the next three weeks. It'll be in the morning and evening services uh, entitled Family Matters. And today we're kicking uh, this off, um, talking this morning and this first message on leadership in the home. There's a, f- a phrase that says, um, love makes the world go round and family makes the ride worthwhile. Today as we talk about families and over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, godly families, healthy families, healthy marriages, healthy parenting. We're going to be talking about leadership and communication, values and, and um, standards in our home. But family, it's one of those things. It, it, there's no getting around it. We all are part of a family. It was Pope John Paul II that, that said this uh, phrase, as the family goes, so goes the nation. And so goes the whole world in which we live. It takes healthy families to produce healthy nations. Our culture is constantly redefining marriage. It's redefining family, redefining standards and values. And as Christians, we need insight. We need biblical insight. We need godly vision for marriage, for parenting, for family values, for family structure, for family life. We need practical plans for applying God's wisdom and his truth to our lives from his word. God is the one that has established the family as the foundation of our society. And so today as, and the next few uh, services as we look at, at family, uh, we're, we're, we wanna start with this foundation of leadership, and really what I'm talking about today is honor. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read a few verses of scripture here, and I have no idea what is going to be shared and what scriptures will be looked at over the next few services. Tonight, I encourage you to come back. We have uh, some of our, our, our lay people going to be sharing in the evening service, and Julie Rocher is going to be bringing a message tonight talking about healthy families. And uh, Julie's a phenomenal communicator, uh, works in the counseling field, and I'm excited for what, um, what's going to come in these next few weeks. And uh, so I encourage you to come back tonight. The snow will be gone. The snow will be stopped. The streets will be plowed. You'll have a perfect uh, drive to church tonight at 6 o'clock. I don't know how many of you know that our evening services are different from our morning service. A lot of churches, it's, it's the same, but we have a different evening service. And so each service, morning and night, different, different worship, different message. We'll take time to uh, just gather together, to be together as families, to f- fellowship and pray for one for another. Uh, it's a good time on, on Sunday evening. I encourage you to come back. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 21. Paul here is talking about uh, family, teaching on the duties and responsibilities of husbands, of wives, of parents and of children. So I want to read through all of these different family relationships, spirit-guided relationships is what it's titled in my Bible. In verse 21 it says, further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a standalone verse, but it sets up the rest of the verses that follow talking about family. We are to submit to one another. We are to offer ourselves to one another. There's something about submission in our relationships as husbands to our wives, wives to husbands, children to parents, but it works in all of our relationships. And this verse right here is talking to, to all of us. And it's not even, hasn't even got into talking about husbands and wives yet. The verse simply says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's how he would have all of our relationships for us to submit to one another, to say, I care about you, I'm gonna think about you, I'm gonna offer myself uh, to, to help you in any way that I can before I help myself. So we're to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. 
As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will, be, you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So I've titled this message this morning, Leadership. And as I mentioned, that we're, we're really talking about honor. In every relationship, what, what Scripture tells us to do is to honor one another. A lot of Scriptures that talk about honor. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says that we are to love each other deeply and that we are to honor one another ahead of ourselves. That's, that's a relationship that we ought to have with one another, to love and to honor one another. But specifically here, we're talking about the relationship of the home. And as we talk about leadership, uh, it was President Theodore Roosevelt that said the leader leads and the boss drives. There's a difference between being a leader and being a boss. A boss sometimes has a, a boss ball or a boss card, and they'll use that to say, it's my position, I have the authority, and you gotta do what I tell you to do. It's that, it's that driving kind of a, a leadership out of you know, put, trying to strictly make them follow, follow your plans. John Maxwell says, leadership is not about titles or position or flow charts. It's about one life influencing another. And so not only is it our relationships maybe that are in the workplace or maybe our, our uh, position or leadership in the church, certainly as parents in our home, but if leadership is one person influencing another person, that involves all of us. We're all called to lead. We have multiple opportunities uh, to lead, and the way Scripture tells us to lead is like a servant. I wanted to read a passage of Scripture for you from Matthew chapter 20. I apologize, not all of these Scriptures are not on the screen, uh, but if you're taking notes, write these down, and you'll have some time to go back and do that. But uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, Jesus said to, to the people, he said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. That's the way the world does it. That's the way the culture around us operates. But among you, Jesus said, it will be different. Whoever wants to, to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus gave us the example. He set the example for what it means to be a leader. And to be a leader uh, by his example was to serve everyone around him. If you want to be great, don't be like the world who lords it over them and says, I'm the boss. I'm the parent. I'm the husband. You know, and we like demand that people are going to, it, it, it doesn't bring about the kind of results that we're looking for. But Jesus said we ought to be a servant. God has placed all of us in a position of leadership. So we need to understand this command, and the command that we're looking at, we're looking at these uh, first few verses in um, Ephesians chapter 6. The focus this morning is on verse 2, where it says to honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. This is one of the, the Ten Commandments. You go back and look in Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5, where those commandments are listed. It's number 5 in the list of 10. The first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with our vertical relationship, our relationship with God himself. Those first four commandments are our relationship to God. And this um, commandment number five is kind of the pivot point for turning the, the, the commandments from our relationship with God to our relationship with people around us. And the very first of those horizontal relationships, those relationships with other people, is this command to honor your father and mother. It's, it's the foundational, it's the pivot uh, point of these, of these commandments. The Bible talks about honoring in a lot of different places. Uh, it tells us that we are not only to honor our parents, but we're to honor marriage. 
We're to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. We're to honor our elders, our leaders, and those in authority. And there's a whole lot of other scriptures, but honor is one of those things that, um, that we see throughout scripture. God gave us this command to honor our father and mother for, for at least two reasons. The first is this. He gave us this command to honor our, our father and mother because we are to honor that position of a parent. We're to bring honor there's not a perfect parent in the world, I don't think. I'm certainly scratching my name from that list. I don't know if there's anybody here that would like to claim that. But we know we're just human people. We're far from perfect. But we're to honor the position of parent, of parenthood, um, no matter how much a parent may dishonor their position as a parent. Does that make sense? No matter what they do, we're still to honor that position. There's a principle here, and, and it, I, I illustrate it like this. You go into a courtroom, and in that courtroom, there will be a, a, a man or a woman who's wearing a black robe sitting behind a bench, a big desk. And as you uh, address that person, what would you call them? Your honor, okay? You may or may not know that person. You may not know a thing about their character. You may know everything about their character, and they may be, they may be mean and nasty. They may be an absolute jerk, but you still approach them and address them as your honor because you're respecting the position. Does that make sense? God wants us to honor our parents. We're to honor that position of parent in our life. God placed the parental position as one in authority of the home, and we are to honor that as children. Secondly, how I relate to my parents is going to affect all the rela other relationships in my life. According to Psychology Today, an article that uh, was written in, in this past decade, the number one goal of modern parenting today is that their children be independent, assertive, and self-reliant. Independent, assertive, and self-reliant. 40 to 50 years ago, the number one goal of parenting was that their kids learn moral values. Isn't that interesting? We're, we're about independence and self-assertiveness and self-reliance. So moral and spiritual values today aren't as popular as they were uh, in our culture in past years. We have, what we have today is an independent generation. An independent generation that's not all that big on submitting to authority. So what we have in our culture, and we all see this, lack of respect for um, law enforcement, respect of, res lack of respect for teachers, for pastors, for, in for elders, for any kind of authority, for coaches or whatever it might be. You see, if someone is corrected, maybe in a work, in a work environment, uh, you wouldn't often see a response uh, like this, yes, sir, you're the boss, whatever you say, sir. Or, yes, ma'am, I will get on that right away. Probably more popular today, because we live in this independent culture, what we're more used to hearing, or, I mean, you can go to, you can go to a public school today, and you can see all of this on display. What you'd see more often is someone saying, no one tells me what to do. I'll make my own choices, and I'll decide if I want to do that or not. Would you agree that that's pretty much kind of the prevailing attitude? We don't hear a lot of, yes, sir, no, sir, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, ma'am, whatever that is. And I, I'm, I'm not meaning to throw our culture under the bus here, but we've got to realize this is, this is the change that's going on in our world. And I know this message is, this is not like the super motivational thing that you're going to walk out going, man, you know, last week, we, we had some awesome time as we prayed around the altar and believed God for miracles and still asking and believing. And that kind of just does something to uh, build us up and pump us up and motivate us. And today I'm just kind of bringing this message. In just a minute, I'm going to get all up in your business. And uh, you, you're, that's why you're all so quiet. But God gave us this command and he's teaching us that we must first learn respect and honor and authority in the home. And by learning those things in our home, it's going to help us in our, uh, responding to the authority around us. So for respect and honor to be part of our culture, it's got to begin and, and be rekindled in our home. And I'm afraid a lot of times our home is a reflection of our culture rather than a reflection of God's word. 
And he tells us here simply, honor your father and mother. So what does honor mean? I mentioned honor a few weeks ago as I was talking about worship uh, and honoring God. But to honor anyone means to regard them with respect and great esteem, high respect. Uh, the word literally means weighty. So you're treating that person as a, as a heavyweight in your life, someone that's important, someone that's significant. And so you're showing honor because you recognize their importance in your life. So why didn't God just say, children, um, love, and, love and, uh, and appreciate your parents versus honor your parents? It has to do with respecting the authority of the position that he's put over. It's not about our, our feel-good uh, feelings about each other. It's, there's a position, and we're to honor that position. Ephesians 6, 2, it says it's the first commandment. Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise. And the promise in verse 3 is that it may go well with you. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. And he follows that up by saying that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I don't think what God is saying here, or what the scripture is saying, what Paul's trying to say is that if you honor your parents, that you're going to live to be 100. Because I know a lot of compliant, good-natured, obedient people who uh, did, have not lived long. And I know some people who are some pretty, pretty uh, rebellious type people who have grown old and crusty who are not honorable kind of people. But this, this promise that was given, and it goes back to uh, the Ten Commandments, as God was giving these commandments to Moses, they were getting ready to approach and go into the promised land, and he was giving them this list of, of the top ten, and what, what he says in that is, honor, honor your father and mother that it, that it will go well with you, that you'll live a long life on the earth. And so as they're getting ready to go into that promised land, this was a national promise, not a personal one. And what he was telling the Israelite people is, if you learn to respect authority in the home, then your nation is going to be strong, and your nation will live long. But if your children don't respect authority, then your nation in time will grow weak, and the foundation will crumble. And I'm afraid as I look around at the culture around us, that's what I see happening is the foundation is crumbling around us because there's not a, not a lot of respect for authority. There's not a lot of respect for leadership. There's not a lot of honoring going on one to another. It's the, the, the sign of our culture. So how do we honor our parents? Because the well-being of any culture is that there is a respect for authority and that there is an honor especially in the home. So the first, the first point that I want to share with you is this, how we, how we show honor. And I, I want to talk to the, to the young people. I know we've got a section of, of younger people here, but I'm talking to any teenagers or anyone who still lives within the direct uh, authority of your parents in the home. Here's, here's, here's what I want to say. Your main responsibility as a child living in a home with your parent, your main responsibility is to have an attitude of respect, to honor, and to obey your parents. The only command that is directed specifically to children in the Bible is obey your parents, Ephesians 6.1. Obey your parents in the Lord for it's right. When you don't respect your parents, what you're doing is discrediting God. Proverbs 19, 26, whoever robs their father and drives out their mother is a child that brings shame and disgrace. And what it's saying is if you rob your father and mother of honor and respect, you're bringing shame and disrespect, not only on God, but onto yourself. Ephesians 6, 1, obey your, obey your parents in the Lord. It's the right thing to do. He's not saying, children, obey your parents if you agree with them, not obey your parents if you think it's fair. He simply says, obey your parents. It's the right thing to do. So how do we obey? I've got three things for you uh, children, students, teenagers. And you'll remember this by the word whip. How many of you, um, growing up, you might have gotten what we used to call whippings? Okay, okay. I'm not talking about that this morning, but you're going to remember it because of that, W-I-P. How do we obey? We obey willingly. When you're obedient to your parents, you're in a real tangible way obeying God. To obey your parents, 
you know, what does scripture say? What Jesus said, when you've done anything to the least of people, you've done it to me. When you honor other people, you're honoring me because we're, we're all his creation. When you serve other people, what we're doing is serving him. When you honor your mom and dad, what you're doing is honoring God. When you're obedient to your parents, you're obeying God. Honoring parents by being willingly obedient is more than just grudgingly giving in. All right, okay. You ever thought that, said that? I'll do it on the outside, but on the inside. I'm, going, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm standing up on the outside, but I'm sitting down on the inside. To honor your parents is to obey the first, their first command. Okay? Willingly obedient. So God has given this command to honor our father and mother, to obey our parents because it's the right thing to do. That is a choice that we have to make to be willingly obedient. I have to choose and make it my choice to say, I will do what my parents says. And I understand there is, a, there is always a, you know, the little uh, caveat of what do you do in this case? I understand there's times when we have to be obedient to Jesus before we're obe- If our parents are asking us to do something immoral and wrong, I get it. But that's such a minute uh, thing. Being obedient to our parents is being obedient to God, and we should do so willingly. The second thing is obey immediately. So we've got willingly and immediately. When your mom asks you to do your homework, how long does it take you to do that? Some of you are motivated to do homework, and you just can't get enough of it. How many of that's, that's you? You just can't get enough homework. I love it so much. I just want... So if your mom asks you to do your homework... How long does it take you to do that? If your dad says, get off the phone and set the table, is that something that you do right away? If somehow your room being clean gets brought up, is that something that you just go and do at that moment, or do they have to nag at you? Do they have to raise their voice and threaten before you respond? And the answer should be, no way, that should never happen. You got it? Okay. Don't ever let that happen. Obey immediately. The next time they ask you to do something like empty the dishwasher, clean the bathroom, get ready for bed, you just do it immediately. In doing so, you're honoring your parents. The phrase that I I remember is delayed obedience is disobedience. So if I'm not doing it immediately, what I'm doing is disobeying. Psalm 119.60, the psalmist says, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. So we should obey willingly, immediately, and pleasantly, without arguing or complaining. Philippians 2.14 says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Isn't that a great verse, mom and dad? Do everything without arguing and complaining. Do everything. Students say this to me, with me. Do everything without arguing and complaining. You guys are pathetic, goodness. Philippians 2, 4, and I'm, I'm helping you memorize a verse. So, doing everything without argument and complaining is when your dad says, be in by 1030. And your response is, uh, you begin to moan. What? Uh, well, I'm the only one that has a curfew. Nobody else has curfews. I'm the only one that has to do that. Nobody else. Parents, you ever heard anything like that? I'm the only one, okay? Literally, I'm the only one. Obey pleasantly. If mom says, I don't want you to go out wearing those earrings because they're six foot long and they're dangling on the ground when you walk. (laughs) Don't go stomp into your room and sitting on your bed and threaten to take your life just because she said you're not going out with those earrings. I know it's a little extreme, but... And I'm not saying that you can't have legitimate questions, okay? There is a time to talk things through. But complaining and moaning and arguing is not the way to, to uh, obey, and especially pleasantly. So you ask the questions, and after that explanation, if it's not exactly how you want it to be, you still obey your mom and dad. You obey pleasantly because you're obeying the Lord. There's this promise, honor your parents, that it may go well with you. That it may go well with you. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I, I don't know that it like, was something I decided along the way or I figured it, I just figured out. I had a lot of friends who um, got in trouble at home a lot. 
and they had curfews. I never had a curfew. I was a teenager in high school and all my friends had curfews. I never had a curfew. Never had my parents say, be in by 10 o'clock or be in by midnight. Uh, honestly, they didn't have to say that because I'm the one that was approaching them. Is it okay for me to go with so-and-so and so-and-so? And it was usually people from, my friends from the youth group that they knew that had been in our house, they trusted them. I, I would only go hang out with people that they trusted and I usually didn't go out. I, I was in by 10 o'clock every night. I would spend time with my family. And so there was never really an opportunity. And I don't know how I did that. It's just something I stumbled into. And I thought, you know what? I don't have a curfew. I'm not messing this thing up at all. I was just a compliant, I was a compliant teenager. And honestly, I can tell you because of obedience and compliance, which just kind of happened, I didn't decide to do that, but it went well with me. If I, and I called my parents, and this was the day before cell phones, I'd find a phone if something was going on, and I'd call my mom or call my dad and say, hey, is it okay if I go to so-and-so's house? And I'm already like screening all of that myself. If I know that they're going to say no, I would just say no, my parents wouldn't lever, would never let me do that. I'd just save the heartache of even having to ask them questions like that. But I'm giving you some tips because this will help you uh, to make your way in life and to have it go well with you. It went well with me. And um, I wish that it went well with all of my kids too, but <laughs> I want to pass this kind of stuff on. And uh, no, my, I have great kids. But so often, teenagers, the, the key to uh, peace in your home is tied to your obeying willingly, pleasantly, and... Um, immediately. You see, if you obey in that kind of a way, um, and you're not rebellious, you're not sarcastic, you're not difficult, um, if, if you do those kind of things, it's going to be miserable for you. I promise you, it will be miserable. But if you can, if you can obey willingly, and you can honor that position of your parents, it's going to go well with you, and there will be peace in your home. It's much better that way, to be compliant, to be obedient, um, to do more than is expected. You do more than expected and your parents are going to go, what? All right, hey, uh, you, you asked for 20 bucks to go? I'll give you 50. Try it and see if it, this might not work. <laughs> I'm, I'm careful. Did I say 50? Wow. But I'm telling you, parents, parents, would you agree with me if, if your kids were going the extra mile and they were doing it willingly and they were doing it with a great attitude, would you not just sit up and take notice and say, you know, if you ask me something, I'm, I'm all for it because you've done, you've done way beyond what I, I mean, versus the, will you get off, will you get off the couch, get off the game, get in your room for the fifth day in a row, go clean your room. It's a little bit different, different scenario, right? All right. Kids, you ready for me to get out of your stuff? Okay, I want to encourage you, obey willingly, immediately, and pleasantly so that it'll go well with you. It'll not only transform your life, it'll transform your family. So now speaking to everybody, that was for those inside the home. Uh, as we grow older, we mature, we leave, obedience looks a little bit different than it did inside the home. So three ways that we honor our parents outside the home. First one is accept them. Accept their God-given role in your life, regardless of their parenting skills. Accept them. Realize that they're the ones who gave you life. It's because of them that you exist. So why not accept them and recognize their place in your life? Proverbs 23, 22 says, listen to your father who gave you life and don't despise your mother when she's old. Accept this fact that you wouldn't be here if it weren't for your mom and dad. So secondly, accept their mistakes. Accept their mistakes. There's, like I said before, there's not a perfect parent, and once you've become a parent, you realize how, um, how difficult it is to be a parent. And so accept the mistakes. That includes forgiveness. We've talked about forgiveness uh, a, a few times recently. We need, we need to forgive one another. When you live in a family with other individuals for a long period of time, there's going to be difficult, there's going to be experience experiences of hurt. It's just going to happen. That's why it's es essential that we build our families with forgiveness. Okay? Accept them, forgive them. It's not popular today to honor your parents. It's more popular to go lie on a couch and talk about why they're your problem. We need to get back to honoring those people that are in authority over us. 
Number two, appreciate your parents. It's amazing as we get older how uh, much we realize uh, how, how smart our parents really are. Seems like, you know, between 20 and 30, they got really smart somewhere. And I, I knew my parents were smart. I, I trusted them. But if you're a parent, you understand how much your parents have done for you. And so honor, to honor them means to appreciate them. Proverbs 3.27 says, don't withhold good from those who deserve it when it's within your power to help them. And your parents deserve it. From the time that you were conceived, they've been sacrificing for you. And there's a time when we mature enough to appreciate what our parents have done for us. If your parents taught you and raised you to know the Lord, you have something to be so appreciative and thankful for. If your parents brought you up to know the Lord, and I'm so thankful for my mom and dad, and at some point, if they're not watching right now, they're gonna be watching this message, and I want them to know how much I appreciate the fact that they raised me with godly values. They raised me to to honor. They raised me to respect people. That was the expectation. It was just expected. Uh, Church was something that we did, and it wasn't even a question of whether we would go. I honestly never asked that question because I knew the answer. We were just always going to go to church. We were always going to be in church, even on a day like this where there's six or eight inches of snow on the ground. It wasn't a question, should we even go today? We were just going to be there. My parents raised us. We were always in church. Some of you have rebelled as a, uh, you rebelled as a teen and through all the prayers and the tears that your parents uh, went through for you and they refused to give up, you have a lot to be appreciative of. Whatever, regardless of what your story is, appreciate your parents. And as you mature, um, not only does honor mean to appreciate, uh, but it also means to affirm them. Leviticus 19.32 says, show respect to the elderly and honor older people. The New Living Translation says, stand up in the presence of the elderly and show respect for the aged. That's something that we're lacking this day and age. When an elderly person walks into your company, you should stand up, show respect, honor those people. I I was amazed uh, a few years ago, we took our, our three oldest kids to Korea and we rode, the, we rode the subway everywhere in Korea. And on the subway train in Korea, the front car is, uh, front part of that front car is reserved for elderly people. There's seats for elderly people at the front. And it was amazing as if people got onto the train and all those seats were taken with elderly people, if an older person walked onto the train, someone would get up and give them their seat. It's an honor and a respect for those who are older than us, affirming. We need to affirm them, show respect. As our parents age, we honor them by affirming them. Stay in touch. It's something I admit that I don't do a great job of, and I'm saying this in front of you, and I'm saying it in front of my parents who are gonna watch this. I need to do a better job of staying in touch with my parents, calling. I'm so thankful for them. And as you age, as your parents age, don't, don't abandon them. Some of you have done such a great job taking care of your parents. I've seen so many of you taking care of your parents in their elderly years, whether it be in your home or uh, in a care center or whatever it is, to, to not neglect them, but to stay in contact and, and help them any way that you can. Don't despise your parents when they're older. Accept them, appreciate them, and affirm them. It's, it's how we honor them when we're outside of the home. So we're, we, we see in the scripture that we're to honor. Uh, but the third thing and the final thing that I want to uh, share with you this morning is that we are to not only honor our father and mother, but we're to be honorable. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So we've learned how uh, children should honor their parents, but it's equally important for mom and dad to be honorable in your dealings with your, with your children. Be honorable. Be honorable in your dealings with other people. Paul says, um, don't exasperate. Don't be unreasonable with your children. As godly parents, we need to exercise the authority in a responsible way. We ought to reflect the presence of Christ in our life in the way that we treat other people in our relationships with other people. Our authority as parents, we've been given that authority, should be based on God's word. 
not on our own desires, not on our own personal whims, but on God's word. Paul, Paul indicates that if we will bring up our children in the training and instruction of the Lord, that we won't exasperate them. It's the key to successful parenting. We, see, we can make sure that they're educated. And we go to great lengths to make sure our kids are educated through high school, provide, help to provide for them in college, all the extracurricular things that we put them in. We, we take care of their education. We take care of their health. Make sure that they uh, are, are in good health. But the greatest thing that we can do as a parent is make sure that they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We must not only tell our kids to follow God's plan, we've got to demonstrate it and model that for them. Show them the way. Like the father and son who were a mountain climbing team and the son spoke to his father who was ahead of him. He said, Dad, choose a good path. I'm coming right behind you. And we realize that as parents, we are leading the way. And we should lead the way for our kids. We're trailblazers. And whether we like it or not, what we do, how we live, how we do life, our kids are going to come behind us. And they're going to follow in the path that, we, that we're leading them in. It should be that way. They should, we should give them an example that they could emulate. We should give them a, a, an example that they can look at and say, I honor you for your sacrifice, for your giving, for uh, serving and honoring God. The way we, we, the way we reflect God's authority in our lives has a dramatic, dramatic impact on the way our kids will respond. So I know that there is exceptions to the rules. We can do everything in an honorable way and our kids still choose a different path. What we do as parents in our, in our talking, what we do as parents in our, in our walking it out, it will affect our kids. But don't despair if you're living honorably and your children are still struggling through those stages of obedience. I want to encourage you, parents, keep doing the right things. Model that for your kids. I had a healthy, respectful fear of my, my dad growing up. Some of you have met my dad. My dad is, was five foot six. He's shrunk a few couple inches, maybe. But my dad is a carpenter, a and short guy, but my dad, I grew up with this idea that my dad could do anything. Even though he was little, my dad was, my, I watched my dad walk on top of walls on a construction site, three or four stories in the air, set in trusses, or I have this picture image of him um, working at, um, at the uh, football stadium up at Iowa State. They were building that stadium, and I have this picture of several guys carrying a big beams, and my dad was part of that part of that, you know, group carrying that, I'm thinking, my dad's like Superman, you know? I realized, you know, my dad, my dad wasn't a perfect man, but I, I had a healthy fear of my dad. I, I had plenty of spankings in my life, and I'm thankful for the fact that he took time to discipline me and teach me. I had a respect for my dad. I would, I, I can only remember one time that I ever talked back to my dad, and it was my senior year of high school, the summer before my senior year of high school, we were building a house. And uh, I'm getting ready for uh, my senior year and I had things going on and my dad was working during the day. We'd go work out there at the evening. He'd give me things to do during the day. I'd drive out to this house. We worked on it. And it was, we dealt with weather and everything like that. And it was just getting tiring. He would work all day. We'd go out there and work till dark. And I remember this one night, it was very cloudy, kind of rainy, and we were hurrying, trying to get uh, the roof on. We had the trusses set, and we were putting the plywood decking on. And um, the trusses were set at two foot, and we had these little um, aluminum clips that, were, that would go in between the, the um, trusses. And for whatever reason, I couldn't get it to work right. They kept falling off, or I couldn't do it right. He'd t explain to me what to do. And it, inevitably, whatever I would try, it wouldn't work. And he was so frustrated. I tried, he said what to do. I, I thought I was doing what he said. And uh, he was so frustrated. He said, are you so stupid that you can't do even the littlest thing uh, that, that I'm telling you to do? And it was one of those moments where something inside of me, I mean, I would, 
Never talked back to my dad, but something inside of me, I, I realized after the fact that I, I had raised my hand and I had pointed my hand right in his face. And I said to my dad, these words were coming out of my mouth before I realized it, if you ever talk to me that way again. And I'm thinking, I am dead. <laughs> my dad could put me on the ground like right now. But it, it was one of those moments, you know, my dad was a, a, a model example for me. Um, but it was just a moment, and it was a moment for me too, and as soon as I started talking, I saw big tears coming out of my dad's eyes, and right there on that roof, we cried, we embraced, we were two men hugging on a, on a roof when we should have been working. We are just sitting there crying. I think we quit at that point and went home. I love my parents, and I'm thankful that they poured into me, and while they weren't perfect, they gave me something to honor whether your parents were honorable or not, the command is to honor your mother and father. That's our responsibility for all ages, to honor our parents. That that be the model for our homes, to honor and to be honorable. It's gonna give at least those coming behind us a path to follow. I look around in our culture and I see that this is not, this is not the norm. I don't see it happening very much, and I, I'm afraid the culture has influenced us more than the scripture. I want our homes to be godly homes. I want our marriages, our families to be godly in the way that we do things, to love one another, to honor one another, to honor our father and mother, to honor one another above ourselves, to honor God. God is the perfect parent, and you can honor him best today by offering your life to him. If you've not, ever, if you've not offered your life to him, to follow him, I challenge you to do that today. It will change your life forever. But I also want to challenge you today to honor your parents, to take that leadership of doing the right thing. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to just ask this question today. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Just, to, just by raising a hand saying, Pastor Jeff, would you pray with me? offer my life to God today, here and now. Is there anyone in the room? Greatest decision that you ever make is to offer your life for Jesus. He gave his life for you. The right response is to give your life to him. And just say, Jesus, here's my life. Forgive me, save me, change me. I'm yours. He forgives us and makes something completely new. It's amazing. That's the way we ought to live. Live our lives. So I want to invite you to stand with me this morning, and we're going to end just a little bit different. There's not a band coming today. I simply want to challenge you and ask you if you'll respond to this, to have a home that's a godly home. That your home, and I'm not saying that by, by responding to the message this morning that you're saying, I've got problems in my home. But realize we all have struggles. We all have struggles. There's not a perfect home. There's not a perfect parent. There's really not a perfect child anywhere. Although some of you are pretty amazing. Um, but if you would say today, I want my home to be a home that honors God. I want my life to be a life that is a representation of who God wants me to be. I need God's help. I need God's strength as a parent. I need God's strength for my marriage. I want my home to be a godly home. I want our church to have uh, families and homes that are solid, that are strong, uh, that are honoring, that are God-fearing, that are a light in a dark world. I want it to make a difference. It starts here. It starts here in our homes. It starts here as a church. And it can change the world, but it has to start here and it has to start now in our own lives. Would you respond by saying, I'm going to commit myself. And you might be here and you don't even have your family with you. You might be here and you're a single person. All of these principles apply to all of our relationships. 
But whether you're here with your family or you're just here as a, a married couple, I want to encourage you to respond today by saying, I want my life, I want my home, I want my family to be who God wants us to be. And you just step forward and come here and stand across the room today as a church to say, that's me, that's us. I want that for me and my family. I want to close today by praying for all of you. If you're coming forward, would you just step forward and make room for other people coming? To honor God, to honor our parents, to honor our children, to show honor in all of our relationships. It's going to change the world. It is so countercultural. But I want to see our homes thrive. Do you join me as we pray? Father, I thank you for every home and every marriage, every family that's represented here. And I know many that aren't here, whether it's sickness or weather, but God, I pray for our church family. God, that you would, that you would um, be welcomed, God, in our, in our homes. We open our hearts to you. We open our homes to you. We open our lives to your word, God, and we allow, would allow your word to penetrate into our lives to change us. God, and the commands that you give us are, are, are not light to be taken lightly. But God, when you say to honor our father and mother, we want to do that. We want our lives, uh, we want things to go well with us in our life, in our home, in our families. God, I pray that you would make our homes, our families, a light to the world around us. We understand, God, that you're a forgiving God and we've made mistakes and we've failed and I pray that we would be able to move on from those things and the struggles that we may find in some families that we would operate in forgiveness just as you've forgiven us that we would forgive one another and not let anything come between us that we would realize that the calling to our of our life that you've called us all to honor one another to prefer one another in love, to put them ahead of ourselves, to care about them before we care about ourselves. And whether that's a, a child to a parent or a parent to a child, a, a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband, whatever the relationship might be, may we commit ourselves to that and see you, God, do amazing things to grow our families to a place where we ought to be and to change the culture that's around us, to change our city, to change this nation, to change the world around us. We commit ourselves to honoring you first, to honoring one another, and allowing you, God, just to have your way in us. Touch every person here, God, every home, every life. May we honor in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So I know this has not been uh, the thing that you walk out going, oh man, I just can't wait to do this. But would you commit yourself to honoring when you come forward today, but as you walk out, I hope that it's different. I hope that you have a different perspective. We are lights in a dark world. Trust God. I love your families. Stay strong. Stay close to God. Stay connected to him. Stay connected in church. Avail yourself to everything that you can that's going to help you to follow, follow God. And I believe that we'll see amazing, amazing things happen. Pray for your kids. Pray for them daily. Pray for your parents daily. We're a team. We're not against each other. We're for each other. Amen.